Charles Battershell, Vietnam, 1971-1972. Charles proudly served with the 1st Air Cavalry, 229th Assault Helicopter Battalion as a crew chief. I interviewed Charles in Phoenix, Arizona on July 13, 2006. His story is very gripping, like Ed Masterson's story. I interviewed them at the same time. And Charles is gone now. He's left this earth, but his legacy lives on. And all of these stories are so timely for the day that we live in. And I'd like to thank John Wynn for sponsoring this story. John, God bless you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for allowing others now to be able to see Charles' complete interview. It's over an hour long that I did with him 15 years ago. If you'd like to sponsor one of these stories, please contact me. There's information in the video description. So without further ado, I proudly present to you Charles Battershell, Vietnam. And I would invite you to share this story with others and welcome our Vietnam vets home. God bless you. First air cap. Right. What years were you in Vietnam? I was there in 71 through 72. Okay. Um, first time in combat, basically when you went to Vietnam, you'd never been in combat anywhere. I mean, Simple there. farm boy. Okay. So, you know, what about before you went over to Vietnam, Charles? I mean, the, the mood of the country, your, your duty to, to serve your country, I mean, what were your thoughts just before you went in? I mean, what were you thinking? I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna surprise you with this. Uh, I graduated early from high school, like in 1969, and right up the street was this university called Kent State University. So in 1969, January, uh, about let's say about November or so, I started to take classes at Kent State University, and uh, to get a jump on things, and I was only 17 years old. Uh, at the same time, my parents had been divorced, so we moved to this little town called Ravana, which was right down the street from Kent State University. And the rest is history, because several months later, my father showed me up, showed up at Kent to bail me and get me the hell out of town, because all the students, the National Guard, the police were shooting students, if you recall, May 4th, 1970. I was, at that time, a member of the SDS, Students of Democratic Society, against the war. What, what, what changed? At the same time, I was, uh, I was drafted. And because my family had split, uh, my mother felt that it was best that I enlisted in the service and select my own field. And she talked me into being an aircraft repairman on helicopters because that's what my brother did, my older brother in the Navy. He was a jet plane mechanic. And because my father wasn't around to give me guidance, I wish he would have been, but divorce kind of really breaks up a family. Uh, being 17, uh, 19 years old at that time, uh, I took her advice. And everybody told me, you know, like the war is over and uh, Nixon's in office and I'm not going to Vietnam, so it's safe. <laughs> not safe for that occupation because one of the pe all the people they were taken at that time were not, you know, grunts or ground pounders or infantrymen or artillery. They were all air crewmen pilots for helicopters, uh, crew chiefs for helicopters, and pff, anybody who had that MOS was destined to go. So how old were you when you went to Vietnam? Nineteen. 
Tell me what you remember about when you first got in country. Uh, was it what you thought it would be? Was there sights and sounds or smells that were particular of interest to you? I mean, what do you remember? Well, the normal route for me was to, I flew out of Ohio to Chicago. And then from Chicago, I had a little layover at Fort Lewis, Washington. And at that base and by Mount Rainier, uh, they prepare you for your deployment to Vietnam. So they take away all your civilian clothes. Uh, your, they box them up and they send them home. Uh, and they give you these fatigues that have slanted pockets on them. And I thought that was weird because all the pockets or the fatigues had your name sideways across this way. So for three days, you stayed at Fort Lewis, Washington. And then from there, I departed to Anchorage, Alaska. And then from there, from Anchorage to Tokyo. And then from Tokyo to a place called Cameron Bay. All done by the Flying Tigers Airlines. So unlike being deployed on a ship and taking three to four months to get to your destination, or however long it takes, I was there overnight and walking off the plane, not into a terminal, but right onto the tarmac. The stewardesses were leading us off the plane in Cameron Bay and they were crying as they let us go. And those kind of memories kind of like haunt me to this day. Because when I got there, the odor and the heat and the humidity Oh, it hit me like a sledgehammer because the smell smelled like, best described as death. So I wasn't on the farm anymore. So I walked onto the steel tarmac off of Cameron Bay, and for the next three days, you, you prepare yourself or you're assigned to your unit that you're going to you go to for your job. Uh, <laughs> one of the first things I discovered was they don't have typical bathrooms. Now I'm used to a lot of privacy on a farm and, and believe me, I, not being in the city, uh, kind of a sheltered life. Uh, there's no bathrooms and when I had to go to the bathroom, I was looking for a, a bathroom and they didn't have one and they pointed to a tube shoved in the ground, a piece of pipe about that big, in an angle with some uh, sheet metal around it, you know, roofing tin. It was about four feet high and shaped in a U, a U or like this. And I said, that's where you take a, you know, you urinate. And it's out there in the middle, right by the PX. So there's Vietnamese girls coming in and out and, and nurses and everything, just walking by like, that's no big deal. And you're actually just stop, drop your drawers and pee in the tube. <laughs> So that was my first day, so that was like a major shock. <laughs> when you're there, nobody really wants to learn who you are for the first three months. They call you newbie. And there's a reason for that, because if you're going to die in Vietnam, you're going to die the first three months because you're new and you don't know how to react or what to expect. So. They initially call you newbie right off the bat, and they just don't want to get to know you. Interesting. So, Charles, so just start telling me. Now, your MOS was what again? 67 November 20. Okay, well, helicopter repairman for UH-1H helicopters. Did you fly on the Hueys at all? I mean, in All the, the damn time. As a crew chief or just... Well, initially when I got in country, uh, from Cameron Bay, they sent me to a place called Tuiwa. And when I later found out, it was a really nice Air Force base. So that's when I discovered the difference between services, okay? When I got to this Air Force base, they had plumbing, they had inside toilets, they had everything, you know, all the nice things you could think. They had a movie theater, a PX, and, and it was right on the beach, too. And when I was assigned there at Tuiwa, I was just an aircraft mechanic. So the crews would go out and get shot up. Uh, and then I'd fix the aircrafts with a crew of those like three or four guys, five guys, and we'd maintain the UH-1 helicopters. And you'd just like get up in the morning and get on a deuce and a quarter, deuce and a half, take the truck to the hangars and work on aircraft. Tell me, this is interesting, tell me what kind of damage were the aircraft receiving and that could tell me what type of weapons that the enemy was using. What were you seeing? Well, in early 71, there was just a lot of small arm stuff. It was AK-47, small arm stuff, nothing, nothing serious. From what I understand, talking to a lot of other guys in the past 30 years since I've been there, that's basically what they saw. It wasn't until 
I got to the first calf and reassigned to Benoit, then things got really hairy. The whole ward changed. So when I left Tuiwa, what happened was in 1971, the 1st Cavalry, the division, was sent home sometime around, I don't know, January or so. So the entire division was sent back to Fort Hood. And what the 1st Cavalry did was gather up what I refer to as the best of what was left over in Vietnam and reassign them to what was then the 3rd Brigade of the 1st Cavalry, or Gary Owen. Okay, so that has its own history. Well, you're part of the Gary Owen Brigade. You are supposed to be the best of the first team. And you usually, when you got there, you already knew that the worst that you could pass combat that you were going to have, you were going to be in it. And that's why they make movies called We Were Soldiers, because that was the 3rd Brigade of the 229th Assault Helicopter Battalion. And you... If you, we were just hoping to make it home alive because there's a lot of Medal of Honor winners. We had two. Uh, everybody walked out of there with silver stars, bronze stars, air medals, if you were an air crewman. And I lost a lot of my friends. There's, there's about 100 guys that I do that, that make home. Uh, excuse me. You're doing great. You're doing great. Can I ask you about Gary Owen? Didn't they in the movie say Gary Owen? Give me this quick of the history of... of okay. That, that well, Gary Owen is originally from General George Custard, okay? And Gary Owen is the name of a song, I think, okay? Uh, there's some... It was turned out to be an original Irish drinking song, okay? And if you go to the First Cavalry website and you turn on the song, you immediately hear it. Uh, I'm not going to sing it for you, but it, it's, it's a call to battle, what it is. It's a, uh, it's a call to battle. It's, it's kind of like different. It's just like when you're a member of the first calf, you're not out there for fighting for country. You're not fighting for God. You're fighting for your friends, your brothers of the first calf. These guys are, will always be my brothers. And it's kind of like... It's difficult because these guys would lay their life down for you. They wouldn't do it for God. They won't do it for country, but they'll do it for you. That's why the first cab is, uh, has such um, distinguished history behind it because it's something they didn't really teach you. You just learned it. I mean... Uh, it's like you were being welcomed in, like, going back home to your own family, right? You'd have brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers that would lay your life down for you, okay, to protect you, to teach you. And when you got the first calf, they did the same thing, at least for me. And uh, all of a sudden you hear about all this history, and they kind of beat it into your head. Not really beat it into your head, but they let you know that you're the first team. You're the best of the best. You're here because we picked you, okay? And uh, one of the things I noticed in my own company, uh, this, no, this, this, this is a lot of respect to the 101st Airborne, was that most of our door gunners were, were from the 101st Airborne. And they had their CIBs, which is the Combat Infantry Badge. So those guys had already seen a lot of battle, and they knew when they came with us and started flying, they were going to see a little bit more than they had in the actual field. So that's what Gary Owen is to, for us. It's, it's a brotherhood. Tell me just briefly what the Huey helicopter was used for uh, in Vietnam and what it was, what it was used for. Okay, for us, we were primary troop deployment. And by the time I got there, we weren't handling regular military troops. I mean, they're all guys from like the 1st of the 7th or 2nd of the 12th or whatever they call themselves. I sometimes lose the names of the regiments and because in the cavalry it goes by the old-fashioned regiments and, and troops because we were referred to as sky troopers or horse soldiers. And so the, the way the military, the army treated us, we were just kind of called differently. So we'd fly out like a, a, a regiment or a company or a troop of, of uh, like grunts, 
But most of the time, in the latter part, it was all special forces, rangers, and flying places that Nixon was telling everybody we weren't going to. Because we were flying, like I would, a couple times I flew special ops into Cambodia and dropped off like special forces or rangers. And we'd drop them out there in the boonies. On our base at Benoit, uh, right around the corner was a group called the 75th Charlie Company Rangers. And they have their own distinguished history. You might have heard of them. Uh, and we were always flying them into just taking them out in nowhere in the middle of jungle, jungle about five or six of them. And uh, they were fully packed, loaded with about 75 pounds on their backpacks. We'd drop them out there for a week, three weeks, three months. And they'd come back. And uh, those guys are a few bricks short of a load. Because <laughs> they were doing things that, that, the, that you didn't think was humanly possible or, or morally right. Uh, but... Later on, we started. We flew Koreans in the battle, uh, the Rock Army. We flew uh, the Arvins, which are the South Vietnamese regulars. And I recall a lot of time, a lot of time spent with the Fifth Arvin Division, which isn't there anymore, of course. Uh, some of the missions that we did is like we flew troop support. I did flying PX. I did like sniffer missions, did Nighthawk, um, and I can explain each one. Um, like flying PX is like you have all these fire bases out there all over the place, and you go get a representative from the PX. And the crew chief and the pilot, we were a team. I, my pilot was Lieutenant Murphy uh, for most of the time. And we'd always go out on the missions. Not every mission would you get a door gunner or a Peter Pilot, as we called it. So if it was a non-combat mission like flying PX, it was just you and him would go out. And you'd go pick up a guy from the PX and you'd load your helicopter with magazines and beer and, and whatever you want to buy at the local store. You know what I mean by PX, don't you? Okay. okay. And you'd go over there and you'd go to these fire bases and you'd sell the stuff from Playboy magazines to, to 12 packs of beer or, or, or a bottle of scotch or, or Jack Daniels or whatever you want. That's what you did. So you went from fire base to fire base, which is really a nice laid back mission because a lot of times you got free stuff coming back, <laughs> like beer. <laughs> then there were uh, missions like called sniffer missions. And you'd put this device inside your helicopter and you go flying around at low level. And, uh, and apparently, and you had this guy that you brought with him who know, knew how to operate this piece of equipment. And it would sniff the ground level, smell it, and detect people. Sometimes it got a little hairy because you'd go down there because it didn't know whether the guy was friendly or not. So you're flying around at your top level and you go peeking around and says, okay, I smell some guy over there. Let's go over there and look. So you go over there and look and find out if he's friendly. Uh, a lot of times he wasn't too friendly, but he was having like just one or two guys or three or four. And it was designed to look for those small concentration of small bands of NVA regulators that would be coming through the jungle. And your job was to sniff them out. It's called a sniff, well, I recall it as a sniffer mission. And then there was called things like Blackhawk or Nighthawk. Nighthawk is when you go out and you fly the perimeter of your, your, your base. And inside my helicopter were these huge flares, about yay big and this big around. And you're flying on altitude, and there's a Loach, which is a light observation helicopter. Uh, it's made by Hughes Aircraft. It looks like an egg with a tail on the end of it. And uh, they, he'd be flying around a treetop level, kind of keeping kind of quiet. And you'd kick out flares lighting up the area when the Loach seen something that thought there was like enemy troop movement coming in at night. Everything, it's all at night. So you'd light up to the area, of course, that when you kick this flare out, and I would set the elevation at which the flare would go off. And the pilot would just go flying around over here. And it was just usually just him and me would go out and do this. And uh, of course, when the flare goes off, it lights up you. And then all of a sudden, if there's some bad guys down there, they start shooting at you. <laughs> And then the loach would identify where the fire's coming from and out of the clear blue sky, and uh, I think it's a AH-6 
60, age six, assault, helicopter, it's a Cobra. A Cobra gunship would come down and just blow the hell out of the place. And that was kind of fun, but a lot of times you get shot at quite a bit because I took several bullet holes. But for the most part, it was all small arms stuff. Uh, when we got into this thing called Onlock in 1972, in the spring of 1972, us and D Company uh, had heard of some infiltration that was coming across the Cambodian border. And for the most part, during Vietnam, it was like just a lot of hit and run missions, little bitty stuff, you know. During Tet Offensive, they tried to get nasty, right, even in, during Tet 68. But it was all small arms stuff until 1972 when the North Vietnamese got real friendly with Russia. And we were flying down into Onlock on, I think it was Highway 17, and we're low leveling. And I got U.S. advisors with me, Special Forces, Green Beret, and Rangers, going to drop them off at the locker room at the soccer field. This is a really nice soccer field. So we're flying down a treetop level, and all of a sudden we come into this rubber plantation. And it, it was beautiful because it reminded me of back home because they look like corn stalks in a field all lined up in a row. And we were flying about, oh, probably 80, 90 miles an hour. And it just looked like the corn rows back in Ohio. And they were rubber trees. And it turned out to be the Michelin Tire Company's rubber plantation. And we're flying down there, and all of a sudden we get on the outside of the, the city limits. And I'm looking through the rubber trees, and I'm seeing tanks, T-54 Russian tanks. And there wasn't one or two of them. There was 30 or 40 of them. And they're all over the place. And when we come low leveling in to drop off our troops, they literally just blew the hell out of us. So we come out of there as quick as we can. We do it like a cyclic dive. And we drop our troops off on the run. I mean, we do a running landing, the helicopter's sliding along the ground, these guys are bailing out, they're running for, you know, cover, and we're just getting hell out of, out of Dodge. And we literally got the hell blown out of us. So we come up and over, and we go off, I, I can't remember, it's the, so yeah, it was on the far east side of Onlock, and as we come do a banking turn, all hell breaks loose again. But they ain't firing no uh, small arm fire. They're firing SAM missiles at us. They're firing heat seekers at us. And we got all the way up to 7,000 feet, which is quite high for a helicopter. And I never had doors on my aircraft. You take the doors off and I put them in my hooch. So all my, like my soundproofing inside my helicopter and the, uh, uh, the doors and a lot of the other equipment that comes with the helicopter, the crew chief's got to keep it. And a lot of times, if you're not careful, guys will steal it off your aircraft because if they're short the stuff for their helicopter, they'll take it off of yours. So I stored it in my room. <laughs> so we're up there and it's really cold at 7,000 feet with no doors on. And as we make the turn, all of a sudden, green tracers come out of nowhere, out of the jungle, just filled the sky with them. And when you see a tracer still burning and it's green at 7,000 feet, that's when the term, your ass is sucking seat comes to light because it's, it's a very frightening experience because you know anything still burning, going straight up, green, is some big stuff they're firing at you. So there was no more small arm stuff anymore. They, they had brought Russian advisors with them. Uh, they had brought missiles. They were prepared to take Saigon. And what was sitting on the other side of that border was over 10,000 NVA. It was the last major battle of all Vietnam that the United States Army was involved with, or I said the U.S. with. And the only thing that was, we were involved with was air support, uh, like Rangers and Special Forces, because there was no U.S. artillery involved in it. There was no, um, you know, grunts or anything like that. Uh, a lot of people lost their lives during that. That's that list of 100 and some guys, and they're all air crewmen. And uh, so we got back to Ben Wall, and uh, they designed a new, new scheme. Well, flight operations had told us 
that we had another mission back in on lock and most of us you know were like writing our our letters back to our folks saying that I don't think we're going to be back and uh, they said they were going to do an arc light that night so we're sitting outside our barracks and on lock I think it's like 60 80 miles away and we watch the sun come up in the middle of the night when the arc, arc light is is a B-52 strike so several B-52s came in from Guam and they did carpet bombing all over on lock and basically told us it was safe to go in. <laughs> safe my ass. So you get a maintenance crank about 3.30 in the morning, you go out and I inspect my aircraft to make sure it's okay to start up. And some of the things you look for is sometimes the uh, Charlie, the Viet Cong would sneak through the wire and take hand grenades and wrap a rubber band or so around it and dump them in your fuel cell. And you know, eventually the, the, the JP-4 will deteriorate the rubber band and blow you up. So you kind of go out and look for kind of things like that, a little sabotage on your aircraft. And then uh, you come back about, I don't know, it's about four or five o'clock in the morning to get your orders from flight ops and you take your mission out. And there was us and D Company. Uh, D Company had the distinct honor of being what's referred to as the red flight. Uh, red means very hot. You're going into a hostile area. Well, A Company at this time, see, A Company had already been at the Idang Valley and a lot of the other really nasty missions in the early part of the war. So A Company got kind of beat up previously, so I guess maybe they decided to give us a break a little bit and we flew yellow. Uh, the flights were broken up in the five aircraft. So you got like red one, red two, red three, red four, red five. And the position of each aircraft would be de depending on the type of communication that aircraft had. So like the red flight would communicate with, corporate, with, with headquarters. In our case, our, we were still the first cavalry division, but the only thing that was there was the third brigade and a few attachments of, uh, of like artillery. There were still a couple, uh, you know, grunt support companies, but they communicated with headquarters. The next red yellow, uh, sorry, red two, was like battalion level communication. And they'd communicate about what the flight was. And the next one was just like radios to talk to the company. And I always got, seemed to get stuck in the third position. And the guys would always ask me, if you guys came in in a flight of five, and I was one of the bad guys, I'd take a lead on the first one, No, I was going to at least get the guy in the middle. And I go, yeah, that's me, guy in the middle. Because <laughs> we took a lot of fire. Uh, but our group was referred to as yellow, so I was always like assigned yellow three. And uh, so when we went in to unlock, uh, I was assigned yellow three. We came in outside of a town to this petroleum zone that you call PZ. In which case we pick up our troops. At this time, they were not U.S. advisors. We were picking the Arvins up uh, from the 5th Arvin Division. And we'd pick them up and we'd load about 11. You can get about 11 Arvins into a UH-1H. You can get about seven regular Army guys in a UH-1H. But if you're running Rangers, you can get maybe five because they're fully packed. But you can squeeze 11 Arvins inside your helicopter. So there's Myself, the pilot, the, the, the co-pilot, and my door gunner. And the door gunner and pilot, I'm sorry, the door gunner and the Peter pilot don't really know what aircraft they're going to get assigned to. They float. They go from one aircraft to the other. But the pilot and the crew chief always, that's their aircraft. That's the one they're assigned to, and that's the one they're responsible for. I don't mean to be bouncing around. No, no, you're fine. You're good. Um, did you guys, now, as far as the Huey... I'm sure at times were you used as like a medevac where you would pick up wounded and take them yes. out? I mean, are there incidents where you helped and assisted with the wounded like that? Or was it all the time or every once in a while? Or, I mean, how, how does that operation work? It's once in a while. It's like there's only so many medevac or dust off that you have. And when, like for example, if a fire base all of a sudden takes a, uh, an, a bombardment, for mortar rounds in the late at night. There may be a lot of injuries where the single or two, I, th I only remember seeing one or two medevac helicopters. 
In cases like that, when a fire base gets hit late at night and there's a lot of injuries, then you're called up to pull medevac, which happened quite a few times, but not on a regular basis. But when we did on lock, that became a regular, that you'd fly in fresh troops, and then you were taking out the wounded and the dead. So you'd go in, drop people off, and you pick up the wounded and the dead. And you'd, well, we didn't have to take out the dead. I'll get to that in a second. But if I can get back to the one part. So we flew into Onlock after they had the B-52 strike. And this is the second day. And there's no rubber plantation left. There's just telephone poles. St just poles, like, uh, uh, like they're corn stalks stripped of all their leaves. And if you've never seen a rubber tree, they have these great big beautiful leaves on them. And it looks like corn stalks, I swear to God to you. I mean, like, there's the, you know, the tree, like a palm tree, and then all of a sudden it's got these great big leaves on it. But they were all gone. What was left was just crater holes. And as we come into Onlock, there's tanks sitting in these crater holes. And uh, as we're flying low-leveling down in to drop off our Arvin troops that we just picked up at the PZs, I see this T-54 Russian tank smoldering away in, the, uh, in, a, in a crater. So we thought. All of a sudden, this turret is lined up like, if, if here's the road, here's the crater hole like this, and we're coming down through this, and as we get about this position, we think this tank right here is dead. All of a sudden, the turret comes very much alive and turns on us. And he's going to blow the whole flight right out of the air before, I mean, we're no more than maybe 100 yards away. And out of my six, I see an F-4 coming in. It's been flying support for us. He comes out of nowhere and just unloads what everything he's got on this tank. Just poof, blows it all to hell. He does a hard right bank out of it. And as he comes out of his bank, he gets blown out of the sky. And we started piling up aircraft, jets, helicopters, all kinds of stuff, just, I don't know, just like over there on the right side. I can't remember what direction. I'm not looking at the compass. I'm just crew chief. The pilot knows where we're at. And uh, later, in years to come, that pilot shows up at Arlington in a place called the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And uh, when they shot him down, his paperwork and everything was somewhere in the vicinity. But Vietnam, the, I mean, I guess Arlington or the government was hot to find an unknown that they can put in that damn tomb. And it turned out to be this Air Force pilot. Now, they really knew who he was because there was some paperwork there. But not within the vicinity. I mean, everybody who went on a flight mission, you went through flight ops, and they recorded every name and body that went into their area, and they accounted for everybody to go back. To say the government didn't know this guy was pure bullshit, but because of the need to put a guy in the tomb, they selected him. I didn't know about years later when the family requested DNA testing. So they DNA tested the guy in the tomb, and it was the guy who saved our lives. So for that whole three-month excursion, 100 and some guys lost their lives, Air Force, Army. And unlike in the movie, we were soldiers, there was about 3,500. We took on 10,000. And for the most part, the crew chiefs and the pilots, we never talked about it. I mean, we knew that at any moment we could, we could be killed or die or get injured, but we never spoke about it. It was like, I have a, a CD of, of, of the things I brought with me that's yours. And it's some of the Super 8 movies that I took. Everybody told me that, that, that knows me and says that I should never give you my Super 8s. But we'll talk about that later. Uh, Did but you bring some of the movies with you? The, the, the reels that you brought? No, I just bought the CD and this is yours. But I, I heard that I'm going to give them to you if you can clean them up. Yeah, yeah. 
and we'll give it to you. Just, we'll leave it here for now. We're, we're going to get to that. Thing. Okay. Um, let me, okay. Uh, trying to process what you're telling me. Did you tell me at the beginning you're with the first calf? First what, calf. What's the regiment battalion company again? 229th okay. Assault Helicopter Battalion. Uh, with the 1st Cavalry, there was three primary battalions of aviation, the 227th, the 228th, and the 229th. The 229th has been removed from the 1st Cavalry and now is part of the 101st Airborne. Now, back in that time, the 101st Airborne didn't have what's called the Air Cav. I mean, the Cavalry Division was specifically traded in their horses, for tanks to, to helicopters. And to give you a little history, um, people that were involved with the cavalry have been people like Theodore Roosevelt and the Rough Riders, okay? General George Custard, okay? Past commanders of the cavalry have been George S. Patton. Uh, most chiefs of the, the chief of the joint Joint Chiefs of the Staff, whatever it's called, are prior division commanders from the 1st Cavalry. You go out there and you'll, if you take a look, if they ever have Joint Chiefs, Staffs, whatever they call it, you'll look and you'll see this patch on this guy's, or, no, on this side means he was the past commander of the Cavalry. And that commander for the President's Council or whatever is from the Cavalry. And the 1st Cav was the first team and always the first in the battle. This story about the Marines being the first is total bunk. Uh, the first cavalry, the first in Japan during the World War II. The first cav led MacArthur back into the Philippines. The uh, first cav was the first in Iraq, I believe, in Iran. Small company. You know, you might say it only takes a few of us to take care of a couple thousand of them. And I'm just BSing there. But that's, they have that distinct honor of being the first team. Or for us, we were the first air calf. Back in Vietnam, that's what they referred to us. Later on, the things that we learned or, or developed called air assault has now been adapted by most of the services now. I think. <laughs> but for what they're doing now, like in the 101st Airborne and the Army and the Navy, the Rangers, the SEALs, they learned from us because we were the ones that did it first. And what, Charles, was there a, a, a strong purpose of you know, being in Vietnam when you were there? You hear things like, we didn't know what we were fighting for and all, they lost sight of the war, you know, why we were there. I mean, was it God and country? Was it survival? What, what was your purpose for being there? When I first got in country, I wasn't attached to the 1st Cavalry. And you didn't really know what the hell you were there for. It's like you got the opinion that we were there just to be uh, used by the Vietnamese people to take care of our, our, our you know, like... Uh, our money you know we were just there to support them with finances things like that because it's like these people didn't care whether at first that's kind of what you were taught or told uh, they don't care about us guys all they want to do is use and abuse us you know the, the hooch whores that's what they call them prostitutes would come around and take your um, I can't remember what they're called uh, piastos uh, South Vietnamese money you get military notes or, you know, anyway, you were you kind of taught that, yeah, you didn't know what the hell you were there for. Uh, why are all these guys dying for nothing? Uh, you hear stories like uh, uh, a lot of friendly fire stuff. Uh, in fact, when I got to Tuiwa, that was the first, my actual assignment was with the 1780 Asian group. They had a lot of racial problems there. And where there was like a groups of blacks that were like, it's like the things that were happening back in Cleveland, Detroit, and and uh, Los Angeles during the riots was also kind of starting off in Vietnam. 
And it seems like we were fighting among ourselves. That all changed when I became part of the Cav. I mean, that guy wasn't black anymore. He was my brother. And uh, one of my best friends, a uh, guy by the name of Samson, I brought a picture up with me, was there, these guys were my brothers. So this, this hatred that they try to teach you wasn't part of the cavalry. And uh, you learn why you were there. And uh, they taught us that we were there to fight for those who were too weak to fight for themselves. And then they showed you who they were. And then you got a true picture that you were there, not for the, the, the corrupt South Vietnamese government that was going on, but for the people. The people just wanted to farm their rice, to be left alone, to not be told what to do, or just somebody come up and take everything they had and shoot them. Because a lot of times, the NDA or the Viet Cong would just go into a village and they would just rape, pillage, and burn, just like us Americans would do. Because there was a lot of times when uh, intel would tell, the, the, tell the, the U.S. guys, the Army guys, that that group was hostile. That was a hostile vision, uh, uh, village. And they'd just go in and just shoot them up, kill everything in sight, because they were ordered to do so. But later in the world, war, uh, like in, starting about 70, I guess, that whole philosophy changed. You learned that you were there to fight for these people because, and you were willing to do so because they were too white, weak to fight for themselves or they didn't know how to. I mean, a Vietnamese uh, is a very small person in comparison to us. Uh, a tall Vietnamese, I'd say, is about five foot four. <laughs> Most of them were like between five foot four and five foot, if that. And they couldn't have weighed more than 100 pounds soaking wet. Uh, and you could see how, you know, a, a regular North Vietnamese could easily just take their life easily. You have to understand that the North Vietnamese had been fighting a war for over 2,000 years. They had been fighting against somebody. And they were well-hardened people. Now, when the end of World War II came, and during some of the armistice that happened, or the treaty that happened, the, the Vietnam was divided. And the South was basically under the control of the French. And how you have a capitalistic country that has now, uh, these are my opinions, mind you, that have now put money, greed, and capitalism into simple people's mind. And so then you had a group of people, we'll call them city people, right? that became corrupt. Mainly, uh, the history tells us that I think one elected group in South Vietnam was just as corrupt as the next one. And uh, we supported whatever capitalistic, you know, government we can get in there, whether they were on the take or not. Most of them were all on the take. But a lot of the people got that, got that way. Uh, like, for example, a lot of the families uh, put their girls into prostitution because of the amount of money they can earn. And uh, I think for the most part, uh, Vietnam turned sour as soon as the end of World War II. I mean, the end of Vietnam was written back in the 40s, in my opinion. Because we just left their ass alone and not done what we, we did, they'd be better sh shape today. So we were there, what well, we learned out later, to help these people. Kind of like maybe get rid of the, how do you get rid of the corruption in politics at the same time help the people? When your own government is supporting that same political democracy. Did you work much with the wounded, or the, you mentioned the dead, how they were taken out. You said you'd tell me later. So what, what did you mean by that? You said you didn't take the dead out. Were there grave registrations? Were there helicopters that came in and did that, or what? Mind you, there were a lot, a lot of dead at on lot, thousands. And there were bodies laying all over the place. It took like three solid months of day-to-day -day flying. Uh, I flew like from 10 to 18 hours a day. And, I mean, after the same thing over and over, you get pretty cold 
We're not cold, but just kind of like used to us, like driving to work. And uh, there were dead bodies all over the place. So there were snipers that had been sitting rotten up in the rubber trees. Uh, there were bodies just laying everywhere. And there was a lot of wounded. So we started taking out, as we took troops in, we took the wounded out. Now, the Arvins primarily took care of the dead. Now, so they'd fly into Onlock, the green body, body bags would be put inside of a helicopter, and they'd been sitting out in the tropical jungle for weeks, maybe as long as a month, just cooking. And uh, the Arvin Air Force in helicopters would primarily bring back the dead in the green body bags. And they'd fly back to the, L's, the, uh, the petroleum zone. That's where the troops were at as well. And as the helicopters would come in to get rid of the, uh, discard the, their cargo, the helicopter would land in a running landing. And the pilots were bailing out of the aircraft before the aircraft actually came to a stop. The helicopter blades are still turning and they're jumping out and they're, they're vomiting as soon as they hit the deck. Now, to let you know how we got so used to it, I'm sitting over on a stack of crates that are holding rockets and missiles and mortar rounds, eating my sea rations. Uh, I took a break from picking up wounding, wounded. So I staggered over there to find out, you know, what made these guys stop their helicopter with the damn thing still running uh, and bail out. And I walked over and there's like 12 green body bags lying inside this Vietnamese uh, Arvin Air Force helicopter. And the entire deck of the aircraft is saturated with a red fluid, we'll say blood. And the entire deck of the aircraft is covered in maggots. And they're just crawling all over the place. And I got so used to doing this on a day-to-day -day basis of flying in, seeing the wounded and the dead, I just kept eating my sea rations. It didn't bother me. Today, the sheer thought of it is just like, what was going on in my head when I was 20 years old or 19? Because something changed. And today, it, it really affects me, the, those events that happened when I was 19, 20. And it hasn't been until recently that I started telling my wife and my kids what Daddy really did. And I'm proud to say I was crew chief for the 1st Cavalry. And we took out the wounded, and uh, we took in troops. And I remember this one particular... We were kids, okay? We were boys. We were 19 years old. In a lot of cases, the South Vietnamese Arvins were... 15, 16, 17 year old. They were babies. I mean, I thought I was really grown up at 19. But this one kid I picked up who was wounded uh, had his leg blown off. And what was left of it was still attached by, the bones were gone, but it was just flesh. And inside of my helicopter, I have four first aid kits. And each first aid kit is one vial or one syringe of morphine. When he came on board, the very first thing I'm doing is I'm reaching my first aid kit to give morphine. And uh, it's rare that anybody does that. I mean, most of the time your first aid kits are never open, uh, for the most part. But in this place, I was opening them up on a regular battle. And I was ready to give him another shot of morphine. And I'm looking at him, and this guy has had enough. He's like 17, 16 years old. His leg is blown off, and he's sitting upright against the deck. This is the back of my helicopter, and he's just proned up against there with his leg gone and what's left of his toes and some flesh. And as we take off flying, the wind, because it, I have no doors on it, is blowing the blood from him onto me and the aircraft. And I'm kind of like speechless to say, well, this guy's had enough morphine. I mean, he's flying pretty good right now. I don't need to go anymore. And I tried to talk to him now. I knew a couple, few phrases in Vietnamese, and he seemed pretty much out of it. So 
I ask him, he asked me, or motioned me, if I had a cigarette. And getting Marlboros, at that, believe me, the first time I got shot down or had a hard landing, I never smoked when I got there, but I started smoking when I, after I got there and got, so you need something to kind of like calm you down. So I started smoking. So anyway, uh, he knew that I had Marlboro, so I pulled out a marble and I gave him a cigarette and lit it up. And he didn't say much of anything except thank you and, and seeing that I was trying to help him. And uh, I never knew what happened to him, whether he made it or not. But most of the people that were fighting for the Arvins in 72, they looked like little kids, 16, 17 years old. And every word of bullshit that they told me earlier about these people was just pure bullshit. Because they were trying. But our own government was putting these strict rules on our engagement. You know, for example, we'd fly in an area, and they'd tell us in flight operations before we even get there that don't expect any fire. It's no hostiles are there. All of a sudden, somebody starts shooting you up, and the pilot has to call back and ask for permission to return fire. Because this is a police action, it's not a war. Congress never declared war in all of Vietnam. Everybody knows that, right? You guys know that, right? Congress never declared war in Vietnam. It was a police action. So we were not allowed to return fire unless intel could confirm that they were hostile. <laughs> and that went on on a regular basis. And believe me, uh, if you're flying in a helicopter, you can hear them from miles away. They go whop, 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 whop through the air, and they're slow as can be. I mean, what, top speed, maybe 140, 150 in a dive? And you could pick one out of the sky with a BB gun, practically. Uh, so you get hit a lot, and sometimes, you know, a small little round from an AK-47 would put you out. In fact, I took a, a small round AK-47 into my uh, hydraulic reservoir and it knocked us out of the sky, and I had to make a repair to my aircraft out in the middle of the boondocks, out in the jungle, to get this helicopter born, uh, you know, off the ground again. Because uh, if you get shot down and on a simple mission, uh, you have to wait for someone to show up. For like the pilot has to call, call in uh, a rescue aircraft to come pick you and the crew up. Uh, when you're in a flight, like a troop deployment thing, there's always five of you. And standing rules, if you were shot down, the aircraft that was following you would follow you down. He would land to your 12 o'clock position, and your job was to make bail and hustle your ass out of your aircraft to the 12 o'clock position. There would be a helicopter waiting to pick you up. But when you're flying these oddball missions where the intel tells you it's not hostile, right, you're on your own. So if you get shot down, you're stuck out there in the jungle, and you've got to wait for something to show up that could be as much as an hour away. So a lot of guys never made it back from these simple non-hostile missions that they always told us. And that went on a lot. You, you were shot down once? I mean, you told yeah, me I got you, shot down. Was this the time you said you started smoking? I mean, what happened on board? You just started diving? Did you crash hard? I mean, what happened? Well, there's really not. You don't crash, crash. I mean, it's like a hard landing, right? You lose function in your aircraft. You could lose your hydraulics. You could lose some of your cyclic controls. Uh, and the pilot does a controlled landing. Some of them is a, a little rough. Well, they refer to you as, you know, I spread my skids. So you have two skids on the aircraft, and you've hit hard enough that you spread your skids out, and then you got to take the damn thing in maintenance, and you got to lift it up with a hoist, the whole aircraft, and replace your skids. And then you got to explain to the guy in maintenance, you know, the maintenance uh, officer, why you had to replace the skids. There was one incident that I got in trouble for uh, the, because of, just, you know, one thing I didn't want to happen to me is get crashed because of my fault, okay? And I'm kind of that way to this day. I want to make sure that aircraft is in perfect shape. The thing is never going to go down on me because of something mechanically was wrong with my aircraft. So I got religious about it. I'd go out there and check that thing all the time. Believe me, if you were in that same position where it's bad enough they're shooting at you, the last thing you want to do is like, uh, run out of gasoline when you're like, as an example, 
5,000 feet in the air. So myself and the rest of my uh, friends that were crew chiefs, we were really obsessed with taking care of our aircraft. Uh, I want to ask a question. We're getting short on time here, but um, tell me about, um, well, I've got several questions, but um, transitioning back into civilian life, did you get a homecoming when you came home? And uh, If not, tell me what happened. And then how, how did you transition back into civilian life? Was it a well, process that you got through? I mean, how did you do it? Well, like everybody else who's in Vietnam, we, we did it this way. I was one of the lucky guys that so we were the last to leave. When you went to Vietnam, you had a D-Rose date, date of separation. Uh, 365 days later, you went home. But when they sent the CAV home, and they, we went together as a group, they took away my D-Rose date, along with everybody else in my unit that had that MOS. We were mission essential, and they had no time for when we could go home. We were there until the duration. So we got our orders to go home, and all of us went home together. I got pictures of all the guys, and we all flew together. So we had our military uniforms on, and the whole aircraft was full of the guys I was in battle with. And it was just like, just like that. One minute we were in a combat mission, the next minute they told us we're going home. They stood down the rest of the CAV, the 3rd Brigade. And we got instant paranoia. And we, were from, we went from combat to the real world in two days. And when we got there, we're, we have lots of medals. And people called us baby killers, spit on us. And I thought what I had done was fight for my country. But what I later found out was I was fighting for a government. I wasn't fighting for my country because the people didn't want us there. And they were right. The French shouldn't even have been there. So I had all my flight suits, my awards, my medals, and I just put them away and forgot them. When people asked me about it, I didn't even tell them I was in the service. I quickly got out of the Army. I, I had to spend some time in the hospital. It, when, the, when I came back from Vietnam, I, I took my uniform off. I walked around in civilian clothes. Any chance I got, I put civilian clothes on and not the military because people hated us, especially if you were in Vietnam. So when I went on the uniform, I mean, originally I had all my medals on, but while I was still in the service, I took them off and didn't put them on except for the National Defense Ribbon because of when I'd go out of town because people would treat me that way, like I was a barbarian, a war mongrel. So I didn't, I just from that day forward. And I quickly, when I got, I went to Fort Carson, Colorado, and I was there to basically get put back together. So I had, you know, some surgery there that they kind of like, I had some, uh, a little bit of head trauma. Uh, they had to patch me up, and I had some surgery, and they patched this up and this up. And I have a little problems with it today. Uh, but in either case, uh, it wasn't until recently that uh, I've kind of like started telling people about what I did. For the most part, only 20% of the two or two and a half million men that went to Vietnam, only 20% were in a combat role. Most of them were, 80% were all support. You know, like from cooks to commanding officers to, they never even seen the Vietnamese. I mean, of all the guys that work for our corporation, and there's about, I'd say probably 20, 25, they're Vietnam veterans. Me and this other person, the only ones that ever saw combat. The other guy's name is Ronnie Sparrows. He was a tunnel rat for the United States Army. And he would climb into these tunnels and, well, you know what tunnel rats do. But him and I are up, are it. Now, there's a lot of guys that were in the Air Force. And they never, you know, it was just like if you ever went to an air base in Vietnam, it looked like stateside. So they were looking, and so were the Marines and the Navy, if the Navy was there. They had regular stateside barracks, movie theaters, PXs. But 
for the cavalry, I was living in a shack, a hooch, okay? I had no PX. I mean, we had a shack that had a few things in it. We had no movie theater. I mean, you go over the Air Force and they had uh, special services to provide where you could take pictures or photographs or, or they'd learn you this or that. In fact, I was taking correspondence courses from Williams and Mary's University uh, on the Air Force side of the base. So I'd leave our shacks on, at Benoit, travel across this open field, which was all Constantine wire, drive across the Air Force base, uh, go on to the Air Force side, and they had, it's just like going back to the United States. That's the difference between how the Army in general and our barracks, or at least with the cavalry, and what they got. So, like this guy by name of, we'll call him Joe, he never saw any what I experienced. I mean, he was sleeping in a regular barracks every night. Well, I'm living in a shack. I have to put my bunk on post about this high. I'll show them in the pictures. Because if you didn't put your bunk in the center of the room, you'd get bitten by rats at night. I'm almost out of time. We've got a couple minutes left. I've got to ask you, have you been back to see the wall in Washington, D.C.? I saw the moving, the, the wall they move, but I've never been back to D.C., but I've seen the other wall. And, and, and How did I, that affect you? Was it an emotional thing for you to see the moving wall? Or? I've seen a lot of my friends on that wall. I went to the years of 71 and 72, and all of a sudden there's a lot of names on that wall in 1972. And majority of them are air crewmen. And uh, I was told that the majority of the 55,000 that died in Vietnam are air crewmen. Now, that's all services. I mean, that's like Navy pilots, Air Force pilots, a lot of helicopter people there. Quickly, what do you want people to remember about Vietnam? What do you think people should remember about Vietnam? Don't blame us. I mean, we were only doing what we were told to do. If you want to blame somebody, <sighs> blame our government for doing something we should have never done. A lot of us feel that Vietnam was a way to show the communists what we were willing to sacrifice for democracy. In other words, We were sacrificial lambs to show no matter what we can do, we can defeat communism. And this is what we're willing to do. That's what I feel. What does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? Well, my family has been here, I'm proud to say, since the year 1616. Family came over on a ship called the Hector from England four years before the Mayflower. Every generation of the batter shells have fought for freedom. Revolutionary War, Civil War, Spanish-American War. My grandfather chased Poncho Villa across the border. His name was Charles Neville, by the way. Unlike in the movie, if you recall the movie Forrest Gump and Lieutenant Dan, where Forrest Gump saves in Vietnam and Lieutenant Dan is screaming his butt off and saying, you know, I was meant to die here because every one of my relatives have died in this war. You know, I had, well, in my family, we made the other guy die for his country. So the batter shells, that's what the flag means to me because my relatives and my ancestors fought for freedom. Maybe not for the government, it's said, but we fought for those stars and bars there because of what it represents. I don't know if that makes sense to you. I want to ask you to do one more thing. I've asked all the veterans to do. At the end of the interview, I asked to give me a salute into the camera. Can you do that for me when I tell you to? Oh, sure. Okay, where, 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 where you at? Can I put my hat on? If you want to, that'd be great. <laughs> okay, Charles, right in the camera. Good deal. Okay.